This is another Troy Built Live sponsored by Troy Built. I'm Emily Murphy with Pass the Pistil. That's P-I-S-T-I-L as in part of a flower. I'm also the author of the Grow What You Love book. And I'm here to talk with you about kids gardening, specifically edible gardening with kids. And I'm really excited to be here today with you to share, share these ideas with you. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I spent a number of years working in school gardens before becoming a garden writer and content creator. And uh, I did that in part to be part of my daughter's education. And I learned a lot along the way, not only, not only um, to, as a way to solidify my own love of gardening, but to bring that to other people. And part of gardening with kids is that opportunity to grow as a person and grow with others and help other people grow like our children or our students or our nieces and nephews the kids in our lives that benefit so much from these plants and so I have a number of activities activities projects for us to students it's like I'm talking to my kids um, I have a number of projects for us to work on today but first I want to talk a little bit about where to start and why it's important uh, why this topic is so valuable um, when we offer plants to children, plants were wired to grow, kids are wired to grow. And when we invite them into the world of nature through our gardens, um, this is my garden here that I am just newly renovating. Um, my family and I, we recently moved and this is my new garden and I'm creating it as a space uh, to do just what I'm talking about here today. But when we invite children into these spaces, we're giving them a number of opportunities. It's a layered, it's a layered opportunity of, of giving them a touch point with nature, giving them a place to play and experiment, letting them get their hands in the dirt, which is so important on a number of levels, that tactile level, and also, um, believe it or not, on the microbial level. Uh, we are healthier the more in touch we are with nature. And gardens are our most immediate touch point with nature. Even if it's simply a container like this, or maybe you have um, a garden in containers like these, or maybe you're gardening in a, um, maybe you're gardening in a fabric pot like this one. Think of how much you can grow in a fabric pot. It's pretty amazing. You can grow an entire herb garden in a pot like this. So um, there's, there's a lot to be excited about here, but, but plants, so plants. So children benefit from this, these, we, okay, backing up. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, when we look at plants, it immediately relieves stress, reduces stress, brings joy. Uh, studies have proven that the more time we have spend outside, um, a minimum of 120 minutes a week is, is what studies are, are uh, pointing to. Um, we increase productivity, we increase the ability to concentrate, we decrease stress, as I mentioned, um, elevate mood, all the good mood senses are firing. When you touch soil, uh, it actually releases serotonin in the body, which again, is all those good mood, good mood vibes. And, and on a physical level, uh, there's the microbial um, activity in the soil, which we benefit from. There are studies that show that um, getting your hands dirty, working with plants, it reduces inflammatory illnesses like asthma and allergies. And so the list goes on and on. And these are things I talk about in my next book, releasing in February of 2022, which is why it's on my mind. But let me share with you some of the how to's now. So we know, we know that growing and gardening is good for us. Uh, we know that offering these things to children is essential, it's really important. Um, but how do, we, how do we actually make that happen? And how do we bring it into our lives? And how do we make it easy uh, to bring it into our lives? And I'm seeing something come up. One second. I, I have a pony tiller. I, mi I missed that question. Um, sorry about that. Sorry about that, but I'm, I'm glad to see that, that I am live and that there's a comment because um, please bring the questions and comments because I would love to answer your questions. Um, and if I don't get to them during the course of this workshop, uh, you can still post them after the workshop and either myself or a team member from the Troy Belt crew uh, will answer it for you. So the, the how to's, here are some of the plants. Uh, I like to start with plants and seeds because 
it's the plants and seeds that we get really excited about. This is the invitation. And this plant in particular, this plant in particular is pineapple sage. And can you see me now? Uh, pineapple sage is this fabulous plant. So if, if I were to say, if you were gardening with kids and what plants to grow, one, you're gonna grow plants you want your kids to eat, right? And maybe it's kale, maybe it's arugula, maybe it's cilantro. Um, but there's also, also these plants that are herbs that you can add to cooking, but also offer this tactile experience. Pineapple sage, when you rub the leaves and you smell your fingers, smells amazingly like pineapple. And this plant brings so much joy in fall. It um, sends up these beautiful red blooms that hummingbirds love. So then you're inviting pollinators and biodiversity, which is its own conversation, which is a fabulous thing to do when we're gardening with kids because it's this whole big picture. It's not just how to plant, it's this big picture, this environment you're, you're giving to your children, your students, again, or your nieces, nephews, whoever it might be uh, that you are hoping to um, inspire by the simple act of growing. So pineapple sage, one of my number one plants. Um, basil, this is a purple basil. It's really fun to see uh, plants like basil or to experience plants like basil and the many forms they come in. Mint is the same way, uh, but basil, cinnamon basil, uh, lemon basil, Mrs. Burns basil, which is a type of lemon basil. This is purple basil, it's a type of sweet basil. Um, the fact that we can pick and eat from these is incredible. And the, again, this is something uh, that children love because of the tactile experience, the fragrances, and they're very simple to grow. Uh, Here's another basil. This is a sweet basil. I'm a big basil fan. Uh, you can put basil in everything from salads to spring rolls uh, and to lettuce wraps that you can make right in your garden. Um, dill. So here's dill. Uh, again, one of those plants that has so much fragrance, you can graze from it. It has this vibrant, incredible flavor when it's grown fresh in the garden. And it's also a host plant to butterflies like swallowtail butterflies or anise swallowtail butterflies that live on the plants. Um, as, so the butterflies lay eggs on the plants. Uh, the larvae then um, develop and hatch out of their eggs and develop um, on their way to becoming butterflies. They eat some of the leaves. And so chew marks in your leaves is another conversation to have with kids. Um, but they eat some of the leaves on their way to becoming butterflies. You're then fostering biodiversity. You're creating this place for butterflies to thrive. You're creating conversation for your children and you have something to grow and eat uh, as a family. And again, like basil, this is something you could add to salads, to uh, you could garnish your potatoes with it. Um, just think of all the things. And what I, what, what I love about plants like, like dill and basil is that they help inform the cooking process and they help inform how, how, to, how to prepare them in the kitchen. And when we invite children into the garden to work with these plants, they then take those same experiences with them to the kitchen. And so then growing some of your own food could lead to, lead to cooking some of the food you've grown and giving children room to experiment in the kitchen. So there's this endless number of possibilities that comes with growing some of your own food and starting uh, this process when children are young. In fact, going back to studies, studies show that children are more likely to eat fruits and vegetables when they've had a garden and they have the ability to grow those fruits and vegetables themselves. And they're more willing then to experiment with fruits and vegetables that they maybe haven't grown themselves, but because they have this baseline of experience with these plants. And so, I mean, the, the wonderful unfolding of this is, it's endless. So last plant I wanna show you, this is lemon verbena. Let me back up a little bit so you can see me. This is lemon verbena. And um, I usually plant lemon verbena in a pear. Uh, it is a warm season plant. So if you live in a cool part of the country, uh, you will wanna grow it as an annual or bring it indoors. It is so incredible. Like pineapple sage, if you rub the leaves, 
and smell your fingers. It is this experience all by itself. And this is one of those plants that my daughter loves. Like even if you just brush up against it in the garden when you're going past it, it is so remarkable. Um, the flowers are diminutive compared to pineapple sage. They're not as flashy and showy, but they're still important. And if you live in a warm season climate, uh, say zone eight and warmer, uh, then it will grow for you as a perennial, especially if you um, mulch it really well, put down compost and straw, uh, but that's this plant. So these are some of the plants I recommend starting with in the garden, if you're, especially if you're starting with the starts. Let me show you some of the seeds as well. And then if there are questions, thanks for asking. Oh, oh that's an answer to a question. Um, now, these are the plants. I'm gonna show you how to pot these up so you can um, form a language to working with your children in the garden. But let's also look at some of the seeds because when we're talking about gardening with kids, we're talking about inspiring them, inspiring curiosity, and giving them room to experiment, fail, try again, which is an incredible life lesson. Um, on a personal note, I was listening to a fabulous NPR story and they were talking about curiosity and how it starts when, we, when we're young and when we're given the opportunity to ask questions, any question, when we're given the opportunity to experiment, when we're given the opportunity to experiment and fail or try again or just experiment, then we grow up to be curious people who have the confidence to try things. And for me, as I've seen it in my, in my work, a garden is the best place, the very best, best place to foster that curiosity. Uh, it's the very best place to allow children to try things and experiment and fail and also have success. I grew that, I did this, look at this, I grew it and I'm taking it into the kitchen and um, I'm gonna cook something with it now. That's really pretty special. So I'm sure I have you 100% convinced that gardening with children is a wonderful thing. We should all be offering gardens to our children, whether our own or children in the community or a school garden. Now, here are some of the seeds I like to start with. Um, these, these don't look like much and they're not true seeds. These are called onion sets. And onion sets are a really easy way to start uh, growing onions. It's a little baby onion waiting to grow. And what's fun about an onion set is that you can talk to children about where the roots are and where the leaves might come from and why that's important. Uh, it also spawns this conversation that inside every seed is a baby plant. And right, so this is a little baby plant waiting to grow. but. If you were, and I, I meant to do this for you, and I, and I left them in on my kitchen counter actually, because I did start it. Uh, if you soak a seed, like a bean seed, in warm water for even an hour, like you're cooking it, then with children, you can open the seed, if you can see this, you can open the seed on one of these suture points on the edge, here or the edge here and pop it open like a, opening a book and when you do that inside you can see the baby plant waiting to grow so you can see what you'll see most initially is you'll see and even if I had soaked them and opened it you probably wouldn't have been able to see it on camera it's really something you need to do on your own but inside the seed again bean, bean seeds are, are wonderful places to start because they're so big inside the seed you're gonna see little leaves like this, little seed leaves. And you're gonna see at the other end, the radical, which is the start of the root. And around that baby plant is what in science we call the endosperm, which is the food. And when you're talking with children, I like to call this the lunchbox. It is, it is everything a plant needs to get its start, a baby plant to get its start. We add soil and we add water and warmth and everything else is inside the seed. Um, and instead of, I do 
of course use the word endosperm because I think it's important for kids to uh, begin to hear this kind of language and understand that, that there's science behind it and you can get in depth. But I love to refer to it as a lunchbox because it has the food the plant needs to grow, which is also why seeds are so nutritious for us because they're loaded with nutrition that plants would otherwise use to get their start. So seeds, let me see what other seeds I have here. Now there's some really cool seeds, right? I'm gonna show you these. I'm gonna show you this too. But when you begin growing some of your own plants, like sunflowers, which these are sunflowers from a giant Russian mammoth uh, sunflower. These seeds are edible. I often save them for birds, but uh, they're beautiful, aren't they? They're so beautiful. And what's fun about growing your own sunflowers is this is then an opportunity for children to gather their own seeds, um, maybe make something for birds, maybe eat some of them, and then save some again to plant in the following season. Plus it's really fun to remove these from the seed head. It's just amazing that I have this at all and that the squirrels didn't eat it first, uh, which is a whole other conversation. But here is one of those seeds, so, so beautiful with its stripes. Um, I have a pumpkin seed here, right? If you're carving pumpkins in the fall, you can save those seeds uh, in a cool, dark place, plant them out again. You get the full circle. And this, this is a seed we don't see very often. This is a jade bean. I'm not sure if you can see this, it's so tiny, but it's the cutest little jade colored bean. And it is a pole bean that um, you grow as a dried bean. And once it's dry, you can put it in a jar and cook it up like you would pinto beans or black beans or anything. Uh, but it has this cool green color. And one of the things I think is so special about growing some of your own food, especially with kids, is that you can grow foods you wouldn't otherwise find in the grocery store and introduce them to the wide range of possibilities. And this this is possible because just think of all the things we can grow from seed or from starts uh, that just aren't available in the grocery store for one reason or another and so um, it opens up a world of possibilities again so you can see the many benefits of gardening with kids those jade beans came from a seed pod like this and gosh these are so beautiful just even crinkling these, just imagine the tactile experience of opening a seed pod after it's dried is really pretty incredible. Now, the last thing I want to show you is a beet seed. And beet and chard are the same. This is a fun conversation because it's going to be hard to see again because these are so tiny. But a beet seed and a chard seed are actually these little nutlets that are three seeds typically fused together. And that's why when you plant a beet or a chard and you say, oh, I only planted one seed, but I have three baby plants. It's because uh, it comes in this one clump, but it's three seeds fused together because that's how the plant makes it. And again, another great conversation. So planting your seeds. And I don't see any other questions yet, but um, if, if you have questions, please post them. One of the most common questions I get is, um, one of the most common questions I get are, what are some of the best seeds to start with with children? So we, we started with plants. Uh, I would say some of the best seeds to start with when growing with children are seeds, are like the ones I've shown you, that are big enough for them to hold in their hands. That are easy to manage uh, like radish seeds for instance radish seeds are a little bit bigger charred seeds too they're a little bit bigger onion sets garlic is another great one uh, what's really fun about planting garlic which you won't do um, right now but later in the fall uh, you can see uh, I don't know if you can see those but radish seeds are big enough for um, a child to pick up and hold and pinch and if you're five and six, that's a big deal, right? Because you're learning how to cut the scissors and you're learning how to use your pencil. Might not be so exciting if you're 10 and 12, but um, depends on depends on your age. 
The other reason, though, that I love radish seeds is, uh, and growing radishes in general with children is because they, you can plant them and they go from seed to radish root, right? From seed to maturity in as little as three weeks. And so there's some immediate gratification there with radish seeds and growing plants with short growing seasons because um, you planted it, you see it sprout, you see it come up and you have something to eat pretty quickly. And uh, that then snowballs hopefully into wanting to grow more and more and like, ah, oh, I did this, right? That sense of success. And then when you have success and you're able to pair it with maybe some of those failures, like it's not even failures, just experimenting with the radish seeds that maybe didn't germinate, then it kind of offsets them and gives you then the confidence to try something new, to keep going. Um, which is what we want. We want our, we, we, and I think as adults, we need this too. And so much of what I'm talking about with gardening with kids completely 100% applies to adults because right now in my work, while I did work in school gardens, I'm mostly working with adults and I mostly hear, what if I kill it? What do, what do I do? Oh my goodness. In fact, in fact, one of the moments I remember quite clearly when I switched from working with children around the time I switched from working with children to adults, I was in the school garden. We were planting lettuces for salad days. And so in this one school, every kindergartner would plant a lettuce seed and help it grow and then transplant it out into the garden when, when the weather was warm. And in later in the spring in about May, those kindergartners would come through, harvest the lettuce, wash it with the help of the older kids, the fifth graders at the time, okay, the school was K through eight, or sorry, K through five, and they would serve salad to the entire school. They'd spin it, uh, they'd garnish it with edible flowers and seeds, um, and the entire school would eat salad that day from the school garden that the kindergartners grew. It was really pretty amazing. Talk about success. Um, anyway, so, I had this experience where the kindergart kindergartners, of course, were making it look really easy because remember, we're wired to grow. And I had a parent come up to me and she said, Emily, if I had known that growing lettuce was so easy, I would have done it a long time ago. And I was like, bing! If I want kids to be gardening more or give them that opportunity, maybe I should be helping parents. So that's where all of you come in. So seeds, planting them. What I like to do when gardening with kids, and I'm going to start with a small pot like this one. I'm going to show you in a small pot because it's easy to move around. But again, when you're growing your garden, what, no matter how much space you have, if you have a raised bed, like my garden, which I'm so lucky to have, if any, any of you have been following my story, uh, um, at past the pistol, P-I-S-T-I-L is the part of the flower. Uh, you'll know that before or not that long ago, I was gardening on a deck and in a community garden and in the garden that I borrowed. And before that, the school garden and my, my deck garden, because we were renting and we just bought this place and we just built these beds and I'm so grateful. Um, so I know not everyone has space like the space behind me to garden, but doesn't, doesn't mean you can't start, you can't start today. Because you can start by growing in containers. Uh, you can start by growing in a grow bag. You can start by growing in a galvanized bin. Uh, you can grow on the ground. And um, I can talk a little bit about those things. I know some of the other Troy Belt experts have talked about how to get your garden started, starting in raised beds versus starting in the ground. And so if I don't answer all your questions, you might just find some of your questions have been answered in some of the other Troy Belt um, YouTube videos, which I highly recommend because it's a fabulous team. So back to this, uh, you can plant in a container like this. I'm going to do that for you right now. So you can see the process. And I'm actually going to use some of the soil from in here because I just took something out of this grow bag. In fact, I, if you look over there, you'll see, kind of see where I'm pointing. There is an arbor that we're building around this shed, which we moved from the backyard to the front yard. It was a really big deal. And between these two posts, let me see if I can get it right, down below, there's a grapevine. 
that was growing in this grow bag until I had the arbor mostly built, it's not quite built. So this is the soil that the grape was growing in. Pop it in there. Now there are more than, there's more than one way to plant a seed. And I love to show these techniques to children because it gives them options and it all depends upon what you're growing, how much space you have, um, the size of the seeds and what your goals are. So with a container like this, you know, you probably would only plant a couple of seeds, right? And with a big seed, like this jade bean or this pole bean seed, this actually looks like it is a, um, maybe it's this one I'm thinking of, is a barlotti bean. Uh, you can take seeds like this and you can simply push them into the soil. How deep do you plant them? Well, the rule of thumb is to plant a seed as twice deep as it is wide. And this is where conversations with kids can start with um, non-standard units of measurement, which leads into maybe giving them a life experience for something they're learning in school. So non-standard units of measurement. Plant the seed as twice deep as it is wide. Hmm, how deep is that? Well, it's about this deep, right? And with that conversation, I also then have the ability to talk about things like, oh, your farmer's inch. Right? And so if that is half inch and you know, because you've taken a ruler, you know earlier, maybe because this is something I would do with, with kids, is take a ruler, have them measure how, where is an inch on their finger? Where's an inch? Or where's a half inch? Okay, get a good look at that. All right, so if the seed needs to be planted half an inch deep, then you place it on the soil like that and you press it in a half an inch. Where, where is your finger? Oh, it's right there. Is it a half inch? It's a half inch. Is that good enough? It is. It's good enough. And then you've given your children, whoever it might be again, the opportunity to learn uh, non-standard units of measurement in the garden, like a farmer's inch. And, um, and it works every time because what's wonderful is, is that, and I know I've said that about a million times because I'm, because I really do think this is pretty special, but, um, is that these are experiences again that kids can take with them into other areas of their life and also that plants are pretty resilient they're pretty forgiving and if we give them the basic the basic ingredients to thrive and grow they will and the same is true with us as humans and the same is true uh, with children in fact there's not that much different when it comes to growing a human and growing a plant we all need space uh, we all need you know uh, water, least an everything but anaerobic bacteria, and um, a little bit of TLC, and the right environment, safe environment, and we can thrive and grow. And so if you keep those things in mind, uh, you really can't, you can't m mess it up. So um, that is, that is planting this type of seed. Now there are also seeds, which I'm going to use these seeds for a different activity in a little bit activity, sorry, I used that word, uh, a different project. Uh, these are California poppy seeds. You can see how tiny they are. Now, if I want to grow a whole bunch of California poppy plants in a container, we'll just use this as an example. We can also scatter sow those seeds. So scatter sow, that means just sprinkle them around, take a little bit more soil. Um, because poppy seeds really don't need to be buried that much, maybe a quarter of an inch, just a tiny, tiny scrim. You press them down, right? Press the soil over the top of it. Sprinkle a little bit of soil, press it down, water it, watch it grow. The other way, let me see here, what seeds I have. The other way, of course, to grow a seed is to make a furrow. I wanted to talk about these two, and then I will move on, I promise. The other way, and I'll show this I know this isn't right to scale, but if you wanted to, you could make a furrow with your finger or chopstick or pencil and make that furrow as deep as your plants need to be planted. So if it's a tiny seed, it might be a quarter inch or an eighth inch. And then you're gonna place your seeds in that furrow. You're gonna space them apart. When you're Usually when you're planting seeds in rows, you're planting them for their final you're planting them to not be transplanted again, right? This is their final home. And you're then going to plant them, hopefully, as far apart 
as wide, so say it's a radish, you know a radish is going to be about an inch wide. Then you're gonna plant those radish seeds about an inch apart because you want to give those radishes room to grow, right? We all need room to grow, just what we were talking about before. And those radish seeds then have that room to grow if we space them out properly. Then when they're too crowded, right, then we have to come back through and thin them, which isn't a huge problem because if you thin uh, your radish starts, you grow too many, you can just cut them with scissors and pop them onto your sandwich or pop them into your salad and eat them. And that's really fun too. So um, if you were to do that, say these are radish seeds, these are not, these are calendula seeds, then you would space them out, cover them over. One of the most important thing with seeds is to make sure they have good uh, seed to soil contact and then water them and watch them grow. They also need air circulation. One of the conversations that I have oftentimes with kids, I don't know if you can hear me when I turn around, I'm sorry. Um, one of the conversations I have quite often with kids is, uh, when we're talking about planting, is, okay, so say you have three brothers and sisters and <laughs> you all slept in the same bed every night. It gets kind of tight, doesn't it? And you kind of need some room. And it's the same with seeds. They need a little bit of room to grow. So uh, spread them out a little bit because we all need we all need a little bit of air and a little bit of our own space. And seeds are no different. When they get crowded, we have to just thin them out. Now, these seeds, before I go on any further, these seeds are really cool because these are calendula seeds. You can see it's kind of shaped like a C. They, I like to talk about them as these prehistoric animals because they have these little bumps and ridges and um, they're just really beautiful and they're forgiving. Unlike having to plant them formally, you can have children just go and sprinkle them out in the garden and you're going to have calendula pop up. Uh, and that's a wonderful uh, opportunity as well to just let nature do what nature does best which is grow. So we talked a little bit about plants to grow with kids. We talked a little bit about what seeds to start with with kids. And we talked a little bit about planting seeds. Now I want to show you um, some of the tricks for planting starts with kids. And I saw a comment come up. Okay, I don't need to answer that one. Uh, let's see. So remember Plants are wired to grow, people are wired to grow. Sometimes starting with seeds is the ideal thing. Sometimes starting with a start is the ideal situation. And it just depends. Um, if you only grow, say, one tomato plant, it's not really worth buying a whole package of seeds. It's probably worth buying a single start. <clears throat> now, one of the things I found with kids and it comes to releasing and planting starts, besides just enjoying them, is is this process of, especially if you're starting, sorry, if you're starting with a plastic pot, is to press on the side of the pot and get a sense for it. And then to not be shy about releasing that plant. You can see that because of the shadow. Releasing this plant from the container. Now, here you see the roots. It's not root bound. It's pretty beautiful, but it needs a home. So then we can talk about root. And root growth and we can also then look at different types of plants and the rooting strategies and talk about um, what you see above so you see below oftentimes plants that are really big have root systems that are equally as big um, some plants have tap roots some plants have these fibrous root systems plants like mint oh my goodness um, always plant mint in a container for one two if you ever plant mint in the ground you come across a space that you have to weed that has mint in it uh, one of the one of the sure ways to keep a child happy is to ask them to pull the roots of mint up out of the soil because they can be as long as the children are tall and it's pretty exciting uh, for the children at least not so much for the parents because you'll always have mint to weed which maybe isn't a bad thing but it can be a lot of work to take care of it so a plant like this and we talk about root systems I'm actually going to use the same container just for sake of space and time. 
because I think that um, I need to make sure I get to a couple other things I want to show you. And I, pardon me if I'm talking too fast. If you um, have questions again, please have me back up. Uh, you can tell this is something that I really enjoy. And uh, I have some videos on some of the projects that I'm, that I'm doing. You need to see them slowed down a little bit. But otherwise, I think you'll find everything you need here on the Troy Built YouTube channel. So I'm taking a little soil out so I can make room for this plant. And you can see right now, I'm just teasing these roots apart because what that tells the plant is, hey, you're no longer in this container. It's okay to stretch your roots out, find new room to find nutrients and water and thrive and grow. So this plant's going into kind of a small container, but what I'm gonna do is move some of the soil aside, maybe add a little bit of soil like this, and then I am just tucking it in like that. And what I like to tell children when they're planting their plant is, to make sure that they plant the plant as deep in their new container as it was growing in the original container that it came from. Because then, you know, the plant's root system is well beneath the soil surface. Uh, it's not exposed. And you also haven't buried the plant too high. So plant it the same depth that was planted before. And you really want to tuck it in because like with seeds, you want the roots to have good root to soil contact. Because when they do, then the, there's connectivity. And that connectivity allows roots to pass through the soil ecosystem and find nutrients and water. When there's a gap, uh, a big gap, then it makes it hard for roots to travel through that space. Plant it like this, give it a little bit of water. One trick is to make sure you're not working with soil that's bone dry, because if it is bone dry, then the water will run what one the water, the water will run right off the top of the soil and that can create its own challenges. This soil is fairly moist. Uh, kids tend to like to uh, really water the plants a lot because that's their way of showing they're caring for the plant. And oftentimes plants don't need that much water. They need to be checked. Uh, so this again is an opportunity to teach them how to, well, let's check the soil. Let's, let's touch it. Uh, is the soil moist? Oh, the plant probably doesn't need any water. Uh, it's probably just fine. Oh, is it dry? Okay, let's water it now. And what kind of a spray, so if you're using a hose or you're using a watering can or even a drip system, but if you're using a watering can or a hose, what spray do you think the plant would appreciate? A hard spray or a nice light gentle spray? Um, and most of them are going to figure out pretty quickly that a nice light gentle spray is probably the best place to start, especially with a baby plant that needs TLC. We tuck them in like we're um, tucking them in to bed, right? There's all kinds of analogies we can use and give them room to grow. So these are our plants. These are some of the plants I would grow with children. There are some other opportunities now that I want to share with you. Can we switch gears? So we have an hour and I wanted to show you a couple of really cool projects that not only could you start with traditional containers and seeds and starts, but you could also make your own containers. And one of the containers I like to make, let me just clear some of these things aside are newspaper seedling pots. We need those for the next project. Actually, I'm gonna do this. I don't wanna lose those poppy seeds, they're so tiny. Let's move these amazing sunflower heads. And I'm gonna show you how to make newspaper seedling pots. So, maybe, you maybe you want to start your own seeds and you don't want to start them in your garden bed and you don't have six packs or other containers 
to grow your seeds in. You can make seed pots out of newspaper and newspaper these days is produced with soy-based eeks and so it's safe. It's actually, newspaper is actually an approved product for or, inorganic farming and gardening. Uh, cardboard is as well. So once you're done with your newspaper pot, you could actually put the whole pot into the ground, the entire thing, roots and all. All you need to make a newspaper pot is a quarter sheet of newspaper. I cut this down and a can, like a tomato paste can. One end is closed, one end is open. And soil, I like to also then have a container to put those newspaper pots into. Let me how this works. It's really simple. And I found that even kids that are as young as four and five can do this. In fact, they're often better at it than the adults, believe it or not, which maybe isn't surprising to you. So here's your, here's your newspaper, here's your can. Again, one end is closed, one end is open. You're gonna take your, I think you can see me here, yep. You're, you're gonna take your can, open end, facing the long end of the newspaper. Let's see, there's a long tail here, and the closed end is there, All right? So you take your newspaper, you're gonna wrap it around the can, you're gonna roll it loosely. And the reason you're going to roll it loosely is because of this lip right here. You can see that lip. So the, I'll show it to you in a second. This is so you can release the newspaper from the can. So mine might be a little tight. I'm just going to give it a wiggle. And then I'm going to hold, hold it here at the fold. And then I'm going to push the newspaper into the open end of the can. I'm going to... Take this out, use the clothes under the can to push down into the newspaper seedling pot. This then seals those folds together. I can then fill it with soil. I'm gonna use seedling soil that I made. It's a peat-free mix that is just compost, coconut core, and worm castings. You have your pot, you have your seed, use your farmer's inch, push it down. I'm going to plant these a half inch. And then you can take the newspaper pot and put it in a tray like this. And I like to use a tray because you can see the newspaper pots are a little bit wobbly. That's okay because when we go to make another one, we're going to work on supporting one another. So let's make one more. Actually, this one's not, I didn't cut the middle of that. The funnies, though, are a really good way to start. Let's see if I can find another one with the newspaper seedling pot process with children. So here's the funnies. Remember, these are plant-based dyes. Even when they look embossed and shiny, it's often just wax that is biodegradable. Closed end, open end. So you're gonna wrap the newspaper around the can, roll it loosely. Make sure that the open end is facing the long end of the newspaper. Give it a little bit of a release. So you don't want it so loose, but you don't want it super tight. I'm holding it here at this flap. You can see there, push it in at that flap. It only needs about three pushes. Flip it over, shake it out. Up, oh, mine's a little bit tight. Sometimes that happens, but it still fit back in. Push it down. Push those folds together. If for some reason it's too tight and you can't get the can back in, you can cheat by just pushing your hands in there. That works too. It's just really fun for kids to see this whole process and make them fill it with soil, pop it in here. Then what's really cool is you can talk about uh, wicking and how water wicks up from the bottom because I'm gonna bottom water these. And so because they're in this solid tray, I'm gonna put about a half inch of water, maybe a quarter inch of water in the tray itself. And then as the soil surface dries out, which is where the seed is, which is where we'd like it to stay moist, as the soil surface dries out, water wicks up from the bottom right to the area where the seed needs it to stay moist. Because once that seed begins the germination process, uh, 
because it has all the right conditions. It has moisture and warmth, a place to grow. We don't want to interrupt that process. And having soil dry out interrupts that process. And so a bottom watering system like this ensures that the area where the seed is growing stays moist. And then you can move it around. You can have it in your house. It doesn't hurt whatever surface it's on. You can do it on your floor. I often put these on heating mats uh, in my house because we just moved and I have no place else to put them. That's okay. So that is paper, making paper pots. Uh, if you need to see that again, you can rewind this part of the video once it's live and, or once it's recorded and ended and you can see it again or you can ask us, um, you can ask us for a repeat. So that's newspaper seedling pot. Another really wonderful activity with kids is, or I'm outside so maybe you can hear my neighbor who's sawing something, uh, is to make seed bombs. Now, Seed bombs are this wonderful, I'm going to make some room. Now, seed bombs are these packages that we make of compost and clay and water and seeds. And when they dry, we can then use them to spread seeds over a large area. Um, some people call this guerrilla gardening. Uh, it might just be a way to create a meadow garden. Um, again, it's really a way to, to increase engagement and get kids in their hands in soil, which is so good for them, and to talk with children about seeds and soil and compost and growing and the possibility of what we could grow uh, with something as simple as seeds and soil and water. And the truth is, parents is that or teachers is that making seed bombs does decrease the seed viability a little bit because you're getting it wet you're drying it out uh, it doesn't decrease the seed viability a hundred percent this is really an engagement tool for um, having this conversation again and getting kids excited about growing some of their own food uh, so you can make seed bombs with I love to use herb seeds because uh, a, a, a whole raised bed of herbs, what could be better? Because herbs go into salads, they go into, um, you know, go, as garnishes on any dish, uh, eat them raw, uh, lettuce wraps, and again, um, another fun one is summer rolls, uh, especially when you're eating outdoors. So I don't have time to show you that part yet, but okay, seed bomb. What you need is some clay, some art clay, I use red art clay and I have that right here and it's five parts clay you can see the clay it's five parts clay to three parts compost to one part seeds so let's see where's my compost I have this wonderfully rich compost here so I'm gonna use this compost I've already measured out the clay Remember, it's, it's parts. So here we're talking about ratios and proportions. Um, while I am using the measuring cup, that's okay. I'm using this as a way to make sure my proportions are pretty much the same. So here's my five parts clay. I've already measured this out. Now I'm going to do three parts compost. Like this, really pretty simple. And then I'm going to do one part seeds. These are California poppy seeds. Remember, you can also do this with herb seeds. I would recommend herbs like uh, cilantro and basil and uh, what else? Cilantro, basil, uh, parsley. What a great plant. Uh, those are all really great plants to start with. Um, Agastache, the um, uh, licorice, uh, what's the common name? Uh, Agastache, you know, it's the common one. I can't remember the common name. Agastache, common, common Agastache that you put in your garden. So then you put in your, your seeds, and then you're gonna add a little bit of water. And the amount of water you, you use depends 
and changes every single time. What you don't want to have happen is you don't want it to get too wet and you don't want it to get, you don't want it to be too dry. So you're just going to add a little bit of water to start. This is really fun. This is like, you can already see what's going to happen here. We're going to make something that looks like a fudge brownie mix. It's going to look good enough to eat. So I'm going to add your water. I'm using a trowel. You could also use a spoon, like a wooden spoon, so it feels like cooking. And you're just mixing it up. You can see this is still pretty dry. Hopefully you can't hear the person behind me sawing. All right, it's starting to thicken up. So this is one of those things where you're just trying it out. Like, ah, this looks pretty good. And that's a good life skill to have too, I think. Because one of the things that happens when you're, when you grow some of your own ingredients, and adults, um, all those parents out there that might be watching or teachers or grandparents, uh, one of the things that happens when you start growing some of your own food is that you find new ways to cook with the food that you're growing. And you might have a recipe that calls for, let's say it calls for uh, celery, but you don't have celery, but you do have parsley in your garden. And so why not substitute parsley for celery? Why not? And see what happens. And that in itself is a fabulous thing to teach, not only parents, Kids. So you can see here, this is actually pretty good. I did it. Sometimes I add too much water and I have to backtrack. So you can see here, here's my seed ball mix. Remember, I mixed in my seeds with five parts clay and three parts compost, one part seeds. I added a little bit of water. I stirred it up and I might need to get some of these areas along the edge, kind of like when you're baking a cake or making frosting and you have to kind of scoop, scoop along the edges. But this is a really good consistency. Let me show you why. So this is a really good consistency. I wasn't sure if you could hear me at the time, so I'm beating myself. And you can see here, it forms this nice neat ball that holds together. And this is a pretty good size. They could be smaller if you wanted more to cast over a larger area. I would recommend going smaller. They could even be smaller yet. You can have kids make them this big or teenier. And then you're going to set them, then you're gonna set them into a container like this and let them dry. It could be you put them on a cookie sheet so they dry really well. And you're going to then finish rolling out these seed bombs until you've rolled them all out. Let them dry, it takes about 24 hours to 48 hours for them to dry. That's pretty fun, huh? You can see my hands are dirty, not too dirty. And then when you go to cast them, that's where the fun begins because here you have these packages. Everything the seed needs, right, to get it started is in the seed itself. But then you have this ball of nutrition that is around this, this really collection of seeds at this point. And this ball of nutrition, you have clay, which eh, it has some nutrient value, compost, and um, it's really the compost that provides that nutrition. And cast it out, see what happens. Uh, and you'll probably, what will end up happening, especially the, the bigger that these are, uh, which maybe you want to make them smaller, what happens is, is you'll end up finding these collections of sprouts all together and yeah I remember we talked earlier about plants needing room to grow but this is really an activity to increase engagement and and um, get kids excited about growing and growing some of their own food and also flowers because part of growing some of your own food is growing flowers because in our gardens and my garden right now it's a little hot back there you can't see it because it's so sunny but um, my garden's new, so it's hard to tell what I'm yet going to do with this garden. Um, but part of growing a food garden is growing flowers because 
a garden is an ecosystem. And in order for that ecosystem to thrive, we need biodiversity. We need uh, bees and butterflies and birds. We need insects of all kinds. Uh, so you can't forget plants like flowers, even if it's plants like cosmos. Uh, I bought these, you can see I bought these, but I also am growing some from seed. And for me, a really good food garden is filled with life. And the more life, the better. Uh, while these aren't native plants, these are fabulous companion plants, Cosmos aren't edible, but they invite, um, so many bees love this plant. And herbs are the same way. So herbs can be their own companion plant. Uh, especially herbs like thyme, uh, basil, if it's left to go to flower. They are also their own companion plants. Calendula, which we have here. And another fabulous activity when you get started with your garden, no matter how big or small, is to go on a bug patrol. So a bug patrol is a chance for you and the children you're working with in the garden to see who's coming to visit. And when you go on your bug patrol, you can ask a set of three questions. Um, if you were a bug, where would you live? Uh, what would you eat, right? And um, who would you be friends with? How, how, how would you get along with people in your environment? Or which plants would you prefer to visit? Um, and so those are three good questions to start with. You say, okay, so, so, how do we then go find bugs in our garden? And that then leads to, you know, if it's spider homes you're looking for, what kind of home would you live in? Where would you be? Then you can start encouraging kids to lift up leaves and look under leaves and look in new places. Uh, who do you think made those chew marks in those leaves? While, while we're led to believe that in a food garden, anything that might be eating your garden other than yourself can be a problem, that's really not, that's really not the case if you treat your garden like an ecosystem and you encourage your children that you're gardening with to see the garden as an ecosystem because what ecosystems need to thrive is biodiversity and there's balance in biodiversity so the more animal life we invite in the more balance you're going to have and the fewer issues you might have with say aphids because um, you're going to have insects that like to eat aphids like ladybugs I have another plant to show you. Let me see if I can find it. It's this chamomile plant. You can see it's quite tall. And ladybugs, uh, while ladybugs are mostly uh, predators of, of plant eating bugs like aphids, they also love uh, chamomile, as do hoverflies, which are truly a fly, but they look like a little tiny bee. And they're one of the wonderful plant, or one of the wonderful bugs, bugs to go look for in the garden with kids. And when you have this diversity of life, uh, food with flowers and different types of flowers with different types of fragrances and, and different types of flowers, then you're going to have this cacophony, this riot of insect life that then you can go and explore with the children you're gardening with. So we're hitting all these points, right? We're hitting, we're hitting food and flavor. We're, we're touching on um, uh, curiosity and how to become lifelong learners. We're teaching kids real life skills of where their food comes from and how might we use this food in the kitchen. We're, we're, we're giving them opportunities to have these real life experiences where they might be translating something they've learned in school into the garden like their farmer's inch. And, uh, and we're giving them room to ask questions, explore, and experiment and understand the world around them and have this touch point with nature which is so important and so valuable uh, that it then translates and has this wonderful domino effect in the rest of our lives uh, it's living with intention and honestly growing what you love right we're growing our, our gardens we're growing our families we're growing our life we're growing our health and that's really pretty powerful and pretty wonderful. And it all happens right here with seeds and flowers and herbs and fun and soil and getting dirty and, and having room to experiment and grow. So this concludes my, uh, my kids, Edible Kids Gardening Workshop. 
I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to work with Toy Belt. Again, this is a, a sponsored workshop by Toy Belt on the Toy Belt YouTube channel. And um, again, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I hope that these tips help you grow as a person, help your family grow, and your garden grow, of course. Uh, and please stay tuned because there's going to be other experts from Toy Belt coming on next after me talking about some of uh, some of the wonderful Tory Belt tools to help you uh, grow a better garden. And if you have questions and comments, please post them. And if I'm not able to um, answer them, someone from the Tory Belt team will. You can find me, Emily Murphy, at Pass the Pistol. That's P I S T I L, as in part of a flower. And um, that's the name of my webpage as well. And I look forward to seeing you somewhere else out there in the world and, and hopefully watching your gardens grow. So thank you so much and best of luck with everything. I'm gonna turn this off, I'm gonna figure it out. Press there, I think I press here. No, maybe I press here, that's what I do.